First on BBC Two, the concluding part of Breaking the News. We got 30 seconds. Millions are watching. The headlines at six we are as newcomers to this medium rather impressed by the whole thing impressed for example in 1951 when ed murrow launched see it now on cbs his audience were thrilled by live shots of the brooklyn bridge yes uh, may we have the brooklyn bridge please Coming right up, Mr. Morrow. Tiananmen Square is the heart of China. This is where most of the major confrontations of modern Chinese history have taken place. Forty years later, Dan Rather, his successor, could routinely report live from the other side of the world. В гости к строителям Октябрьского района столицы пришли представители молодежи. In the Soviet Union, the news started off as the obedient handmaiden of the Communist Party. 19 августа, 17 часов 20 минут, мы находимся на Краснокопресненской набережной. Yet in 1991, it played a central part in rallying opposition to the communist coup. So far, we know there are 23 survivors after Manchester United's air crash at Munich this afternoon. In the Britain of the 50s, news was very much the genteel but poor relation within the BBC. You can hear them firing now. They're firing down, in fact, in this direction every now and then. By the end of the 80s, it had the staff, the money and the ambition to chronicle the dramatic changes which swept across Eastern Europe. The army's strength was overwhelming, given that there were probably never more than 100 or... Television news had been transformed, but the pace of change was to accelerate. A new era beckoned. We have main engine start. Four, three, two, one, and lift off. By the mid-80s, the American networks had stopped covering shuttle launches live. They were no longer deemed unusual enough to warrant interrupting the soaps. But the cable news network covered the news 24 hours a day, and a shuttle launch helped to fill the schedules. After more delays than NASA cares to count, Here, looking very carefully at the situation. Obviously, a major malfunction. Much of the daily output was routine and mundane, but occasionally the viewers were rewarded with a front seat at the making of history. We are there to, to provide the news hungry, those who care about public affairs, current events. We're there to say, here, you don't have to wait till the evening news comes at 6:30 Eastern. It's right out there. It's called news on demand. CNN was the brainchild of an Atlanta entrepreneur, Ted Turner, who owned sports teams and a local cable television network. But news is an expensive business, and Turner's pockets were too shallow. Once the money vanished, the, the easy source, he was out begging, borrowing, and not quite stealing, uh, just to keep the, net, the network going. At one point, he told the guy who sold the hot dogs at his baseball stadium to pay him in advance. He let him off for 80%. And so we ran the network for a couple of months on hot dogs and uh, beer money. But CNN found new audiences by distributing the news by satellite and used new technology to keep down costs. By 1985, Turner felt confident enough to rock the boat in the biggest possible way. He made a bid for one of the big three networks. It was Ted Turner's day. Bright lights, TV cameras, and the announcement how Ted Turner plans to take over CBS. We have decided to attempt to have the shareholders of CBS decide for themselves whether they would like to have Turner Broadcasting acquire control of CBS. 
Turner's bid failed, but the American network elite were now forced to take CNN seriously. When CNN came in, it was ridiculed. Um, I'm, I'm, I myself, more out of fear than anything else, once said, if CNN's the answer, what's the question? Um, which was, seemed terribly smart at the time and pretty stupid in retrospect. Oil-rich Kuwait is invaded by Iraq and asks the rest of the world for help. Iraq's President Hussein warns his troops will turn Kuwait into a graveyard if foreign powers intervene. Elsewhere, the BBC was still holding on to its reputation as one of the great powers in the old broadcasting world. But the Gulf War forced the corporation to acknowledge that it too had to change radically. The five-month build-up to the war was a perfect opportunity for the news organisations to prepare. The key to success was putting people and equipment in the right places. We did what we would normally do. We deployed a large amount of people and, uh, and with a large amount of money uh, and, a, and a high degree of planning. Uh, and we set about establishing what we thought was an invincible news gathering mechanism to cover what was clearly going to be a huge event. All the news organisations chose to broadcast from the Allied side. It was the obvious thing to do. CNN went further. They still had something to prove. Our competitors in the BBC, the other networks, did not have the motivation that we had. We were trying to prove ourselves. For the first few years, our competitors called us CNN chicken noodle news. They ridiculed us. This was the opportunity that our management felt, and all of us who worked on CNN felt, to really prove we could do the job. From the beginning, we looked at Baghdad as a key component. Once we got invited in there, along with other journalists into Baghdad, and met the Iraqis, we found we could deal with them. They were interested in coverage. We told the Iraqis we wanted to stay, whatever happened, and they responded. CNN was the only organization to gain permission to put a satellite link into Baghdad, though it had only installed a sound link by the start of the war. When the attack finally came, CNN were interviewing the former US Defense Secretary, Caspar Weinberger. This is conjecture. I must insist this is conjecture. Indeed, there was one very interesting note that uh, Bernie said, and that was... We were listening on our four-wire apparatus to that interview. ...of when our, our planes had to go over Tripoli in Libya. And I turned and looked out the window, and I could see chaff floating down, aluminum chaff, the kind of material that's used in combat that's dropped from planes to jam radar. And as that chaff was floating down, I looked again. The air raid sirens kicked on. And then the anti-aircraft batteries on all sides of the hotel just started frantically cannonading into the air, into the air. And I screamed into the four-wire, tell Atlanta to come back to us. We have to go to Baghdad, Secretary. Uh, we're, we're going to Bernard Shaw in Baghdad. Anybody in journalism tends to think, especially if you're young and starting out, boy, if I get a big story, a great story, I'm just going to be outstanding and brilliant, and what I report is going to be so memorably phrased. Well, I failed that aspiration in that test. The most unbrilliant words possible came out of my mouth. Uh, this is, uh, something is happening outside. <laughs> well, something was happening. pictures followed a day later. The tapes were shipped overland to Amman in Jordan and satellited from there. By the time the Allies bombed a shelter full of women and children, the satellite link in Baghdad was in place. Workers said that by early Thursday they had cut through the steel doors that were jammed shut by the bomb blast. Earlier in the day, this reporter saw 15 bodies brought out in just half an hour. Most of them were young children whose bodies were charred almost beyond recognition. What kind of military 
very situation that they are talking no, about. No, it. Sure where is it? Where is it? Just no, tell me, where is it after that all? Iraqi officials said 288 bodies had been removed by late afternoon, 91 of those children. To the Pentagon's annoyance, CNN showed the Iraqi viewpoint. We were given no warning of this raid at all. It was a complete surprise. And because they were on the air all the time, CNN were the only broadcaster to show everything as it happened. They conveyed both the tedium and the excitement. Their rivals had to admit it was a winning combination. They were thinking ahead of us. They were deployed in a better way. They put more hardware onto it. They put more people onto it. They were extremely fleet of foot and we spent a long time trying to catch up. That's not to say that the people working for the BBC in the field didn't do a very courageous, very formidable, and very taut journalistic number, but we were stuffed. Do you have a message for President Bush? Peace and negotiation. Once again, we see that no neighbor of Iraq is safe. We're also... Um, uh, impressed by the fact that the United States has... Uh, CNN didn't just cover the news, they made it. You have to have a uh, global reach. The BBC at that point had it in radio, with World Service Radio. We did not have it in terms of television around the world, but CNN did. By having that global reach, they made their own luck. Uh, the fact is they were in the offices of prime ministers, of presidents, of uh, chiefs of staff, and so on, all around the world who would watch what was going on in CNN, uh, appear on CNN, somebody else would then comment. I mean, they effectively made ambassadors obsolete. At least it seemed that. At last, the chicken noodle network had become a global player. We were like that uh, actor on the stage who uh, prepares all his life for that one first night of victory. Considering what all was taking place worldwide and that the, the kind of mosaic we were trying to present, I don't think we did half bad for a bunch of little southern boys and girls. In a complex, ever-changing world, one channel will always keep you better informed. Headlines it was a success that forced the hand of the BBC. Within months, it brought forward its plans for a television equivalent of its Radio World Service, delivered by satellite 24 hours a day. From acclaimed documentaries to news and business analysis. What it made us all sit up and think was, here is something which we can deliver to the world. If CNN can do that, then so can we. BBC World. After all, CNN is an American voice uh, uh, to the world, uh, an American perspective on world events. There should also be, we argued, uh, a British or a European view on world events as well. And there's nothing anybody can do to say. Is, um, How is um, Burton and Somalia coming on? The BBC decided that it had to respond to the CNN phenomenon. Even the success of its domestic news output depended on it. It was a case of adapt or die. The key offering the BBC has got, which puts it apart from any other UK broadcaster and almost any other broadcaster around the world, probably bar CNN, is the reach of its news gathering, the bureaus, the correspondence, the firepower it has out in the field. The most hopeless country on earth. We went through an efficiency program, moving uh, resources from uh, production back at base into the field uh, to get exactly that firepower around the world. As communism collapsed in the Soviet Union, television journalism was completing a revolution of its own. When Mikhail Gorbachev resigned and the Soviet Union became the Russian Federation, journalists found themselves working for new masters. There was a new Russian channel. Добрый вечер. Сегодняшний день начинает отсчет новой истории Советского Союза бывшего Советского Союза. Единого государства, занимающего одну шестую часть суши, больше не будет. А есть содружество из 11 независимых государств, заявили сегодня в Алмате их лидеры. Судя по стремительности работы... Репортеры ревели в их новую свободу. Journalists were referred to as soldiers of the ideological front. And what is amazing is how quickly that changed. 
the desire on the on the part of the journalist to express himself or herself as the case may be uh, to be extremely critical in a way payback for all the years when you could not criticize uh, critical to the point of certainly not being objective but saying oh man am I giving it to them just look at me I think that perhaps is the most startling basic unpredictable change that happened in Russian television even after the fall of communism the continuing importance of television was brought home during the 1993 coup against Boris Yeltsin's government Ostankina, the Moscow TV center, was occupied by rebels and only retaken after a bloody battle. It brought home the fragility of the new freedom in the Russian media. Elena Pozniak was a producer whose job it had been to make aged Soviet leaders, such as Leonid Brezhnev, more presentable on television. I was not only hopeful, but very enthusiastic. I moved from the government station to the Russian channel, where they were trying to create a new Russian national television. There were new young people working there, trying to tell the truth as it really was. After about six months, I realized we hadn't escaped from our past. I felt that the people who called themselves Democrats were, of course, former communists. They had been born, brought up and had lived in our country. And our place of birth is the USSR. We can't escape that. Posniak's worries were confirmed when President Yeltsin visited Britain in 1992. Pictures were sent to Moscow, where Pozniak edited them for evening transmission. The visit was rounded off with a press conference. But her theory... The uh, confrontation of forces... When she saw the images of her drunken president, Pozniak called in her boss. I asked my bosses to view the material. A very important figure in the Russian channel saw it and said, wipe the tape at once. Pozniak felt she was doing exactly the same work under Yeltsin as she'd done under his communist predecessors. Disillusioned, she resigned from the main Russian channel and joined a much smaller local one. Many people thought this was the end of my career. For me, it was a willing choice. Nowadays, when I can't speak the truth, when my experience and talent can only be used to clean things up, to sanitize them, and forgive me for being brutally honest, for making up corpses, we mustn't do that anymore. Another group of journalists also decided to leave and formed their own privately funded company, NTV. They aimed to win audiences through tough reporting, and as with CNN, it was a war that established their reputation. Their chief correspondent in the Chechen war was Andrei Chekhasov. I was very worried because this was my first experience of war, the first time I'd reported on it. I arrived in Grozny in January 1995, on Friday the 13th. I'm a bit superstitious, so I was anxious about that too. To tell the truth, I hadn't expected such fierce fighting in Grozny. Chekhasov's first report came from an underground field hospital. These images were anathema to the Russian authorities. They refused to allow satellite links in Grozny 
and Chekhasov was forced to send video cassettes to a neighboring part of Russia for transmission. The sight of coffins coming home was reminiscent of the Vietnam War and had a similar effect in Russia as that war had in America. Those who planned the Chechen operation simply forgot, didn't consider that it was taking place in a changed country, a democratic country, with an independent mass media. NTV also reported from the Chechen side. Reporters like Elena Masyuk won awards for interviews with enemy commanders. On the Chechen side, there was little trouble setting up satellite links. Journalists were welcome. You can say that the Chechens understood, unlike the federal side, the advantages of propaganda in this war. They calculated every moment for its propaganda value, and in this they completely surpassed the federal side. Within Russia, NTV's critical reporting undermined government policy. The backlash wasn't long in coming. We got a phone call from Mr. Soskovitz. I didn't speak to him, but that's not important. The message was for all of us. Another day or two of this reporting and we'll close your company down. We'll take away your license. So we, of course, followed the tried and trusted path. We made a fuss and gave interviews to foreign journalists. The repercussions spread around the world and eventually we were left alone. The Moscow prosecutor charged the producers of NTV's equivalent of spitting image with slander. The singer was the Minister of Defence with Boris Yeltsin in the chorus. The case caused ridicule and was dropped. They couldn't have given us a better present because they made themselves into a laughing stock. To prosecute a satirical program. You have to be a total idiot. In the West, another war, the conflict in Bosnia, proved to be the testing ground for the BBC's latest technology and its public service ideals. Are you recording? Yes, yes, we can do it. Okay, we're running now. We're going to be seeing it. Very much on the defensive. The corporation decided to report the war for the duration, at great expense and no return in audience share. Apart from CNN, they were alone in this commitment. It was absolutely right that we stayed with uh, a civil war where people were being massacred, killed on the mainland of Europe for the first time since the Second World War. Absolutely right we committed to covering that story. Being there, reporting it day by day, making it intelligible to the audience, making sure that people could not say elsewhere around the world, we didn't know this was happening. But with satellite links, the pressure on reporters was growing. They were expected to file their stories more frequently and had less time to prepare. There has been a gun battle going on around this hotel in the parkland all morning. This is a change that excites me and appalls me both at the same time. Okay. 
It excites me because it is vivid. It does allow me to show the reality of what is happening almost as it happens back home. It hasn't stopped. Uh, it's quite intense. It appalls me because you tend to concentrate so much on what's just in front of you. It's very difficult to see the, the wood for the trees and the, and the war for the battle. And it creates pressures on us to be first and fast rather than to be the best and the most accurate. That is a hard one to say. The, the, uh, I'm sorry, it's a little bit disturbing, some of this noise. I think it's pretty... You have to appear before this damned eye about 15 times a day. And you don't know what's happening, because you have no chance to find it out. Bosnian forces tonight ambushed a federal army convoy, even though their leader... This dilemma was at its most acute on one important story early in the war. The smoke was rising from the ruins of the city. Some buildings were destroyed completely, many others badly damaged, and the bodies of the dead still lay on the streets. The business of the it was one of the classic the cases, a very serious uh, incident early on in the Bosnian War, when uh, by a complicated exchange, President Izet Begovic had been captured by the Serbs. There was a Serbian general held more or less hostage in central Sarajevo, and a complicated deal was done, which involved them both driving out in the same UN convoy. And it was hijacked. It was cut off. About a dozen Serbs were killed. Uh, it was a turning point of the war at that time. I wasn't there. Bosnian television tonight showed the arguments that started when the... And the only video came the from what I call soldier vision. Soldier vision are the pictures which are shot by a camera on a military shoulder. They're shot by army cameramen, and you suddenly get this video, as you're not quite sure how it was shot or under what conditions. And you cannot check either, you cannot verify. Martin Bell, BBC News, Sarajevo. I couldn't be there because I was filing. You spend so much time broadcasting that you, in the end, you really don't know what's going on. The technology also tended to tie reporters to one side in the conflict. People suppose that journalists are where the news is. This is not so. The news is where journalists are. In television, increasingly, the journalists are gathered around their, their dishes, especially their satellite dish, which is our conduit to the world. Oh, hello, Scar. It's uh, BBC Bosnia here. I hope you're expecting a K-80 package for the 6 o'clock news. OK, they are recording. If you get your dish and you park it in a place, it puts out tentacles and roots. It grows. It's difficult to move. And the news tends to come in from close around it. So it was difficult to cross the front lines into Serb-held territory, sometimes impossible. But more and more, more and more, we were discouraged from doing so. And I think we, I think the, the, in the nature of television, we were mechanically biased against the Serbs. We would report the bombardment of Sarajevo by the Serbs. We would not report the infantry attack which may have provoked the bombardment because we weren't there. And the insatiable demand for fresh news meant that if mistakes were made, they were never corrected. It's a concern that came to a head with the shelling of Sarajevo market. A single shell landed in the market in the center of the old town. It was thronged with people buying and selling the little they have left. The market's at its busiest at the weekend and life seemed almost normal this morning. So far we know that at least 40 people have been killed. An untold number of people have been wounded. The dead and the wounded are still coming to Kosovo Hospital, but this is certainly the worst massacre in 22 months of the siege of this city. As the afternoon wore on... The pictures of the Sarajevo market massacre on the 5th of February 1994 were on the global village within an hour. Appalling pictures of people with heads blown off, shredded limbs and so on. The emotion was clear and there were a lot of senior journalists at that point in Sarajevo for various reasons. As a result, that gave it extra prominence. There was no question that it was a Serb mortar or shell because as far as the international press by and large were concerned, it was only the Serbs who shelled central Bosnia. North, northeast. But when the UN experts measured the traces of the explosion, they found this assumption was wrong. Within several days, it became absolutely clear that it was not a Serb shell 
or a Serb mortar, that it had been fired by a Bosnian mortar position ambiguously on the line between the Bosnians and the Serbs, so it was virtually untraceable. That fact was made public on the 16th of February, but by that time the story had a life of its own for 11 days and the assumption and the belief and why challenge it was that the Serbs had committed that atrocity. Despite the dangers of bias and blinkered vision, electronic news gathering brought great advantages. The first light in Sarajevo brought the first shots of a desperate battle. You're gaining because you, you have that immediacy, that sense of being able to know what's happening now. And you can't, you can't uninvent that. Because we can now do that, you've got to have it. On the other hand, new technology, the pace of deadlines and so on, puts on correspondence a huge strain. They have to be able to give the proper contextualised picture as well as reporting the immediate things. And getting that balance right is very difficult. Give me a reset on your audio. Resetting audio. Audio is good and take it. In the increasingly competitive environment of American television, news shows were now marketed like Hollywood miniseries. Once you get onto prime time, competing with entertainment programs, you, you have a Faustian bargain with, with journalism. All magazine shows, whether they're with Dateline or Primetime Live and so forth, have in them the seeds of this Faustian bargain. You, in the end, all your producers, even if you don't tell them, know what gets an audience and what doesn't get an audience. And there's a threshold below which you're going to get cancelled. That's the Faustian bargain. Barnett, who had always railed against dancing of any kind, began to preach that members could make a spiritual connection with Jesus by dancing with spouses other than their own. That's not Barnett's wife, and this is not an evening social. It's a typical the disease of magazine shows is that breast cancer or wife beating or violence or drugs and so forth is going to get audiences' attention rather more than foreign policy is. These pictures were taken with a hidden camera and the help of ex-members who say Community Chapel has been reduced to a sex cult. If you are going to get into the people's minds in that living room or bathroom or wherever the television set is, you've got to use the techniques that are on either side of them. The advertisers who spend millions of dollars for a one-minute commercial are using all kinds of video techniques to do what? To convey information. Tonight, on day one, what could drive a man from a seemingly normal background to commit some of the most unspeakable crimes imaginable? His name has come to mean serial murder. Ohio was the first one, then no more until Wisconsin. I blacked out and it started again. In the refrigerator, beside an open box of baking soda, was a severed head. In the top drawer of a filing cabinet, three skulls. In the bottom drawer, a collection of bones. They found hundreds of photographs of dismembered bodies. On the bed was a Polaroid camera. Under it, a knife. Whether it's the use of music or uh, snappy editing or visual effects electronically generated or the construction of the story with a tease and uh, that gets you hooked into it all of that are acceptable conventions now in conveying information we're coming up on this are we live on the air? Bob, you've got this audio. Bob Go ahead. Turner, uh, we're over the uh, 5 freeway, past the 55 freeway. O.J. Simpson is believed to be in the white Bronco that you see in the center of your picture, followed by as many as nine Orange County Sheriff's deputies. The O.J. Simpson case exemplified the values that have become the key to success in American television. That picture of the slow speed car chase on the highway when O.J. Simpson and his white Bronco was apparently leaving town and didn't, 
was peculiarly powerful. Everybody in our newsroom was fascinated by it. And from that moment on, we knew it would be a major, major story. Here you have a national sports hero who becomes a very well-known movie person, marries a beautiful woman, and then is accused of stabbing her and a man to death on the steps of her house. You know, from the days of the Bible, we have understood that violence, sin, uh, anything you want is the stuff that keeps you interested. Now there was a technology that allowed you not only to know about it, but to see it as it unfolded in the forum in which the judgment would be made. Not guilty. Tonight, on Hard Copy, a world exclusive, a key witness in the case against O.J. Simpson breaks her silence. I caught him in a lie. All I wanted was uh, an autograph from my son. He never knew he was getting perhaps the last autograph O.J. Simpson would sign before being arrested for murder, or that it would make Don Detzler a witness in the most sensational murder trial of this generation. The trial highlighted the problem of race relations in America, but it also induced a bout of soul-searching in the news business. This is Greg Lefebvre, CNN, reporting live from downtown Los Angeles. At one level, covering the daily proceedings were valid, but to endlessly talk about them in our overnight program was going too far. But having said that, many people watched CNN, and uh, our ratings were high. So I don't think we have to apologize for that. Detective Furman, did you plant or manufacture any evidence in this case? I assert my Fifth Amendment privilege. The more it was interesting, the more we showed it. The more we showed it, the more interesting it got. There's no reason why people should not be interested in what is interesting. Simpson stood to face the mostly black jury as the verdicts were read. We, the jury, in the above entitled action, find the defendant or job. Orenthal James Simpson not guilty of the crime of murder in violation of Penal Code Section 187A, a felony upon Nicole Brown Simpson, a human being, as charged in count one of the information. The verdict pulled the largest audience ever to watch a single event on American television. Television is show business. Television news is part of television. Finish the logic. Television news has show business elements in it. The difference is that we deal with facts and can find the drama or the laughter in real people, real events. In the new commercial Russian television, Producers of programs like Catastrophe rapidly learnt the same lessons about winning audiences. In the past, they weren't allowed to report disasters or crime. Now they couldn't stop. The Russians have been at least as inventive as the Americans and equally hard-hitting. In his top-of-the-rating series, The Man in the Mask, the veteran journalist Vladimir Pozner interviewed a KGB hitman. Ну, не будем играть словами. Да, Уже да, вначале да, сказали, давайте да, будем да, называть да, вещи да, своими да, именами. Убивали. убивали. Я задавал вам вопрос. Вы лично сколько людей убрали? С 91 -го года наша группа исполнила 41 человека на моей совести семеро. 
being in television in this country now, depending on, on what you're doing, of course, gives you a sense of actually doing something that people care about, not just entertaining and not just having fun yourself, but at the end of the day, sitting down and saying, damn it, I did something. And that's very important. But not all Western ideas translated so easily. In the presidential election campaign of 1996, BBC-style impartiality was a non-runner. Television journalists couldn't afford to be too critical of Boris Yeltsin, since his survival guaranteed their freedom of speech. Fortunately, he proved an able television campaigner. He reacted well and quickly to journalists' questions, not at press conferences or interviews, but in short encounters known as photo opportunities. <laughs> and in these short minutes he would rise to the occasion and say things that immediately became news, that would immediately appear on television. It wasn't we who did this. The president created the opportunities and understood what it was to be a newsmaker. Yeltsin's opponent, Gennady Zhuganov, an unreconstructed communist, advocated putting the clock back. Unfortunately for him, he has no human warmth. Even when he smiles, it's like the grin of a wolf. But it was more than style that put off the journalists. Turning the clock back would mean returning to state control. The reporters knew on which side their bread was buttered. Impartiality between Yeltsin and Zhuganov meant in practice supporting Zhuganov. We understood perfectly that to support Zhuganov would mean burying ourselves and burying freedom in Russia. When Zhuganov turned up to be interviewed in Ostankina, his presence was a reminder of the days when television was totally censored. The journalists never forgot that. Let's be fair, he did not get equal time. He did not get equal time. The feeling was, you don't want to give this man equal time, you don't want to do anything to help him win the election, because if that happens, then for me, the journalist, it's all over. I will never again have the possibility to even try to be objective. This country is so polarized, is so politicized, that it's very difficult to be a, a, a objective. People are caught up in it. I think it's much easier in a society that is not in flux. You take a society where things are basically functioning, where, where you have stability. Uh, yes, it's much easier to be objective. I think that that will happen in Russia when, eventually, there will be more stability. In Russia, there's a new generation of producers growing up who aren't burdened with the memories of the struggle against communist censorship. They drive imported cars and sport expensive Western tastes. Hello. Привет. The most successful is Alexander Akopov, who produces business programs for the new capitalist Russia. Like many people in Russian TV, I didn't receive any journalistic or artistic training. With a lot of trouble, we got a book called Code Producers Guidelines. We gave it to our English-speaking colleagues, and they translated it within a week. Unfortunately, it's not that easy for us Russians to catch up with the 80 years' experience of the BBC. Still, it gave us a sense of direction in our work. Three, 
два, один. Добрый день. Здравствуйте. Вы смотрите информационный канал. Акупов's venture is supported by a new Russian media conglomerate, who've invested three million dollars. Мотор. Недавний указ президента, ограничивающий рост тарифов на продукцию. Любая телевизионная компания, тем более большая, тем более национальная. Any TV company, especially a large national broadcaster, is no different from a car or soft drinks manufacturer. Прохладительных напитков. И точно так же. Just as you have to make your car beautiful to sell it, so you have to make beautiful programs. Вы должны сделать красивым ваше телевидение. He wasn't content simply to make conventional programs, but now offers a computer-based service delivered by cable to business subscribers. For two thousand dollars a month, they receive not only a business channel, but an information service as well. Over the past two years, it's become clear that TV technology is rapidly going digital, moving into software. We see how the cost of computers is falling and their power rising, and we see how fast television production is being computerized. It's clear to me that in the next ten years, the viewer will be using a hybrid of TV and the computer. And so the future of TV is interactive. Поэтому будущее телевидения это, конечно же, интерактивность. MSNBC on the internet, not duplication but innovation, instant access to the world. Five your bomb in four, three, two, one. We're bumping in. Welcome back. As the terrible fighting between Israeli troops and Palestinians continues today, we thought we'd see what's on the web about it. Here's our internet correspondent, Mary Kathleen Flynn. Mary Hi, Kay. Jody. Good morning. Well, I think the most powerful thing that the internet can do... In, in the United States, news organizations are already developing in the same direction. All of them have pages on the internet accessible by computer. What we've got here, this is Palestine. Net and uh, it's a, a site that's been. MSNBC is a partnership between NBC and the world's largest computer software company, Microsoft. This kind of fusion could have profound consequences for news. So the internet really lets you trace the history of a conflict like this, which I think helps people understand why it becomes. I think to some extent it's going to change the nature of journalism when viewers become editors. All the way across the world. This is already happening in some computer technology uh, right here in the United States. Uh, in fact, uh, on our internet site, we give people the ability to select the type of stories um, they wish. Uh, but we'll still be in the business of covering those stories and making them available to people. 3,000 miles away in Cambridge, that dream is already a reality. A thousand homes are linked to a computerized distribution center. A customer can switch on, select a channel and a particular service. They even have access to scripts. You know the sewage thing that we've been talking about? Perhaps we'll have a look at that, do you reckon? Using a special remote control, they can choose the stories they wish to view, skipping any item they want to ignore. Legally binding standards idea. and water quality. It's one of eight rivers around the country which will be subject to the drive for cleaner water. For the first time in television history, the audience can set their own news agenda. I think we're entering uh, the third age of news. The first age of news was radio. Wonderful, wasn't it? it? Took us through all sorts of crises. The second age of news was the coming of television and we've developed that uh, a lot over the last 20 or more years. The thing which runs through the first age and the second age of, 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 of news broadcasting is the fact that we were telling people what we wanted them to know. We were in control. We would deliver things to you at times that suited us, in a manner that suited us, and of an agenda that suited us. The third age of news, which we're now entering, is pioneered by the fact 
that um, it's no longer enough for us to say you must be interested in this then how in this third age of broadcasting where the power is with the consumer to say I'm not interested I don't want to know how do we actually get them interested and I think that's going to be the big challenge of the next 10 years Hebron the Israelis hand over to the Palestinians history is being made and Jeremy Bowen is there to report it in the third age of news, when the viewers can decide what they want to see, will there still be a place for reporters like him? If television news is going to be about something more simply than entertainment or filling time, they need to be there. You need to be there so when people say that's not true, you can say, yes it is, I saw it, I heard it. Those were my eyes and my ears. So I'm 100% certain about what I've, uh, what I've reported today. Without question, this is a new beginning, at least for the 80% of Hebron's Palestinians who live under the new dispensation. If what you do, though, is a product which is a homogenized pap of pictures that you've picked up from uh, various satellite exchanges around Europe uh, with scripts written by people who've never done anything other than see life through through the the computer screen and of course it's going to be rubbish no one's going to want to see it of course it's going to be rubbish as a daily television journalist there is no more exciting feeling knowing that in your bag there's one or two tapes which just say it all you've got everything you need all the ingredients to make a great story that that shows people what it was like to be there at that particular moment Let's go.